Good morning. Good morning. Excuse the glow that I'm exuding right now. It's not perspiration, is it? It's more glow uh, from running around like a headless chook. Uh, we had a few extra challenges today, but we will get there. If you're watching, if you're here, or you're watching online, welcome, welcome. It's good to be here as God's people. If you need the facilities, ladies on the left, gents up the up the right. Uh, this is our formal part of the service. We meet before the formal part and after the formal part. We encourage each other. We share over a cup of tea. Today, after our morning tea, uh, our rock youth will be heading off for a fish and chips run, which I'm really looking forward to as well. Here at Warhope Prezi, we're on about Jesus. So it's good to meet in his name. Let's pray. God, you are good. You are faithful. You are true. You don't rush around like a headless truck like I do. You are always in control. You are calm. You are not surprised. You are not flustered. You are sure and steady. You are a foundation upon which we can build our life. You are the solid rock. Father, help us to look to you today. Help us to learn more about who Jesus is and trust him more as we look at your word. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. Gail's going to present our reading for today. Thanks, Gail. Uh, uh, Mark. Chapter 8, verses 22 to 30. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not enter, do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea, Philippi. And on the way he asked his, the disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Thank you, Gail. Before we open God's word, let's pray. Oh, Father, we need you to open our hearts and our minds, help us to lay aside distraction, to hear freshly your word spoken to us. We pray this in Jesus' good name. For his glory's sake. Amen. Uh, you may not know this, but I'm a bit of a nerd. And I, I, I yeah. Uh, when we were younger at, at university, we would have what we'd call land parties. Have you heard of that before? A land party? Local area network. Does that help you have a clue what it, what it is? You're like, no. What you did was you'd go to a, a bachelor's unit <clears throat> and you'd air it out first. You'd open all the windows, you'd get the boys to clean the kitchen out and you'd, you'd vacuum the place and dust it down. Uh, well, I would get them to do that anyway. And then we would uh, all bring out PC computers, big ones, they were old ones with boxes and big fat screens. We'd, we'd load up on tables up to 13 people with different computers in these small two-bedroom, three-unit unit. And then for a long weekend would game. How long ago? Excuse me. <laughs> How long ago? It was a while ago. I was in my early twenties. All right, so about more than twenty years ago. And so we'd hook up all these computers, and and, and, and then and then our better halves would we would have a barbecue afternoon just to actually be human for a little bit. And so we'd open up the curtains. Oh, oh. You'd, and you'd open up the outside and you get the barbecue going and you try to air out the house because the smell of that many young blokes in a, in a unit all gaming and going, Mys! Apparently it's really boring to watch. <laughs> just, <laughs> just twitching, gotcha! You know, um, <laughs> but walking out into the sunlight. Maybe, maybe the closest experience you may have had is, is a theatre and it's been really dark in the theatre and you walk out into the bright summer light. I remember particularly in Bathurst, there's not much distance between the leaving the cinema itself and walking and it's just, it's so hard to adjust, isn't it? You kind of feel surreal and you don't really know what's real anymore and it, you feel a dis disorientation. 
or you're in a really deep sleep, like you're out for it. Some schmuck turns the light on. Whoa! It's, just, it's, it's almost like physical pain. It takes time for sight to come. Sometimes sight comes slowly. So my voice is weak today, so I will raise it up to my mouth. Sometimes sight comes, sight comes slowly. But sometimes the sight we're talking about is understanding. Seeing what someone or something is about. And understanding, seeing who Jesus is, well, it appears to be taking some time. And I know we say this a lot in this series in Mark, but guess what? That's the big theme of Mark. And we are coming to the climax before we start a down southerly trip to Jerusalem. Today, as we read from the Gospel of Mark, the author gives us two examples of dawning sight. First in the restoration of a man's actual sight, then in the disciples finally seeing who Jesus is. Well, sort of, kind of, nearly. Mostly there. Right? No, not even most. Uh, okay, not really, but sort of, right? So what, what did Jesus say to his disciples last time we were here? It should still be ringing in our ears from last week. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Do you not yet understand? You can just see Jesus pulling out his head. With these words still ringing in our ears, we follow Jesus and his disciples as they come to Bethsaida. And what happens when he gets there? Well, what we expect to happen by now, you know, even in a mostly Gentile, non-Jewish area, the locals of Bethsaida, they've heard of Jesus and they bring him, they bring to him a man who is blind. They beg Jesus just to touch him. They know Jesus can heal. They may not know anything else about him, but they know that much. So very much like Jesus did with the deaf man not long ago, Jesus well, okay, okay, this time he takes the blind man by the hand, otherwise it would be pretty useless saying, hey, come with me, right? Um, but, but again, he, he takes the man away from the crowd. He leads him away, takes him out of the village. And again, Jesus, to us, which is rather gross, he uses saliva and touches the man. But we explained that last time, didn't we? But then uh, things begin to change. Things take a bit of a turn. It's a bit different from when he healed the deaf man. Jesus, he asks a strange question. Has he ever asked about the efficacy or the usefulness or the success of a miracle before? No. So unique is this question, we're meant to notice it. It is deliberate. Mark has taken the effort to record it because it's there for a reason. Normally Jesus speaks on what? He lays his hands and what? Or someone just touches the very edge of his cloak and what? Boom! They're instantly healed. Bang! Done! He can say, your daughter is well, go in faith. And at that moment she is well, even before she gets to walk home and see her daughter. Instant healing. Every single time he commands a demon to go and they don't get a choice about it. They go. But here, he spits in his eyes, touches him and so, how'd that go? What? Do you see anything? And the guy lady, he kind of looks up and, yeah, I can see some moving shapes, so I suppose they're people, right? But I can't see them clearly. They might as well be trees. That's the, that's the inference of what he's saying here. I, I know they're people because they're walking around, but... <laughs> uh, now think about that. He, he is not healed instantly. His sight has begun to come back. And Jesus deliberately asks the question to highlight the fact. Now, for us, we're mostly grossed out by the fact that Jesus spat in someone's face. Please, kids, don't go and try this at home. It's not going to win you any friends, okay? It is not a good strategy. If you missed the last time we talked about this over the deaf man, spit in the ancient world used to symbolise healing. They believed that spit had healing properties, 
I know. Next time you complain about cough syrup or medication, just be glad your mum's not spitting in your face, right? Okay? That's what they used to think. Although, occasionally, yeah, mum still might give you a spit clean from time to time. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. So there is a hist- there's historical foundation for that, okay? So mums, I'm sorry I've backed you up on that one, but you got back up. No, no, no. We're meant to be noticing the fact that he asked the question. That's what we're meant to notice. Just that often we're so grossed out about the spit, we forget. Jesus deliberately asked the question to highlight the fact that the sight is slowly coming back. It's partial. Jesus deliberately heals this man in part before pausing, making note of it, and then again, once the guys acknowledge that it's only partial and everyone else, their friends, get to hear that acknowledgement, it's only then that he lays his hands on him and finishes the job. And I tell you what, my goodness, does he finish the job? Again, notice some repetition. Check it out. The blind man, he opens his eyes. His sight is restored. He sees everything clearly. He is healed three times over. The language is quite deliberate. After an extended restoring process, this man's sight is utterly restored. Three times over. Three times restored. Gradually, but utterly. Now think about this. This is happening in a particular context in the narrative. Think about slow coming to sight, but the end goal, perfection in sight, like complete sight, utter sight. This gradual but utter healing occurs in the middle of a series of events where the crowds, the religious leaders, and Jesus' disciples, they're all struggling to see who Jesus is. And in this context, that it's in this context that Jesus gradually but utterly restores the sight of this blind man. This, this is very, very deliberate. We're meant to pick this up. Now, could the blind man solve his own problem? Like kids, when you're blind, can you just kind of fix it? There's no band-aid you can put on or medical... You're blind. That's it. There's nothing you can do. There is no hope for this guy. There is no hope for him to see unless Jesus intervenes. The reality is, guys, we would all be blind. We are all blind to who Jesus is until he does a healing work on us. Are we still a bit unsure about who Jesus is? Then we need to be praying and talking to God and asking God, show me who Jesus is. Help me to understand him so well that I want to follow him, that I want to serve him. I know he is true. I know he's God's saviour. I know he's the king. But Lord, unless you show me, unless you show my heart, I will stay blind. And sometimes that seeing takes time. Just like you know, maths took me a lot of time to get my head around. Right? Sometimes it takes time. Understanding Jesus is not a complete once-only event. We can know enough about Jesus to say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. You are the king, for sure. And when we know enough to make that decision, we have to make that decision. We stick to it. But for the rest of our lives, we get to continue to learn about who Jesus is. We will never, ever know everything about Jesus. He is God the Son, the eternal, divine creator of the universe. Of course, it's going to be a while before we get to see him. Sorry learn everything about him, but pretty cool, we will actually get to see him face to face one day and have perfect vision of who he is. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I'm going off track here. Uh, Anyway, so something the disciples, they're just about to find out, as Jesus once again takes them away, they themselves have something to learn, right? So what does he do? Let's get out of here. Keep getting found by random people. We really need to stop. Jesus wants to start teaching the disciples about who he is. And so they head up north. They go as far north as you can in Palestine and still be in Palestine. They go right up north. It's about 170 k's north of Jerusalem. 170 kilometres north of Jerusalem. That's a long, long way to walk. Okay? It's in the foothills of Mount Hermon. And this is a really interesting place. 
the place matters. There sat the city of Caesarea Philippi in a region deeply steeped in ancient religions. This is where, if you're watching Indiana Jones, the creepy music would kind of kick in, right? Uh, this is the creepy... This is the, all right, it, let, let me get into it. Caesarea Philippi only had its name recently changed to that. It used to be called Peneus. And it was on the hillside there was a, a cavern which they revered, the locals. It was said to have been the birthplace of the Greek god Pan, the so-called god of nature. Wow, this is a mystical place. Ancient history, this, this is a place where, you know, you can imagine Indiana Jones actually being there. Um, and before this, even further back, this area had once been a great centre of worship for the so-called god of Baal, the cruel and ancient religion of Palestine. And again in this area, uh, there was a cave in the hillside where gushed a stream and it was understood to be the source of the river Jordan, a symbol of the spiritual life of Israel itself. Further up the hill, this is in the same area by the way, right? Further up the hill, even further, stood this massive white marble temple built by Herod Philip to the, div to the divinity of Caesar, the Roman emperor. So if you wanted to Stay in the good books with um, the emperor. You built a temple to him. And uh, there was one sitting there as well. And why was it built there? Because this is a centre of worship. This is a deeply, deeply spiritual, pagan place. Here in the minds of the locals around Caesarea Philippi, the memories of Baal stir. The gods of classical Greece brood over the valleys. The hand of the divine emperor rules the Jordan flows in constant memorial of Israel's conquests. This is where we are. And here of all places against the backdrop of all that religion and all that history, a Galilean carpenter with a hick Nazarene accent, with the visions of being a teacher and a rabbi of God's people, he asks his disciples, So, uh, who do people say that I am? Who, who do people say I am? Now, the disciples, they've been able to mingle with the crowd. You know how um, you don't necessarily say in front of the teacher what you really think? But definitely at recess or lunchtime, you're having your little conversations and definitely uh, what pe people think tends to come out. So Jesus is asking the disciples, hey, you've been amongst the crowds. You've probably heard the rumours and the whispers and the conversations when they're not realising you're standing there. But what, do, what do the people say I am? Let's get the conversation going and... Well, what do they reckon? Who do they say I am? Because what Jesus does forces people to make some sort of conclusion. He is no ordinary man. I'd be interested in some bloke who can feed me from a small boy's lunchbox, for sure. Who do they say I am? Well, John the Baptist. Elijah. One of the prophets. Now, these guys are all prophets, and they, the, the crowds, they reckon Jesus, they, man, he has to be like a prophet of old. Maybe he's one of those dudes, or someone like them come back. Which, you know, to be fair, you know, to be fair, that's, that's not too far off the mark, is it? That's pretty good. I mean, Jesus is a great prophet, but is that all Jesus is? One of the weird, weird realisations that we all have growing up is eventually we realise, hey, a teacher's not just a teacher, they're actually a human being too. Remember the first time you met a teacher outside the classroom downtown? That was almost a horror. Like, what are you doing here? You're meant to be at school, right? You belong in a classroom. Do you actually, not all of us remember that moment, but sometimes some of us have had that moment where you actually see your teacher for the very first time out of the classroom. Hey, is it what? Like, they've got kids. They've got a husband. Poor guy. Right? Um, right? Or, or whatever it is, there's this realisation of, of who Jesus... Maybe a prophet. Maybe that's who Jesus is. But that's not all he is. He's not just a prophet. There's more to him than that. No, no, no. Like so many people today, the crowd's view of Jesus is too small. It's not big enough. Like so many today, they have not yet seen, they haven't fully understood who Jesus is. 
So if that's what the crowds think, if that's what the crowds think, Jesus asks the disciples, all right, yeah. so what about you? Your turn. What do you think? But you, who do you say I am? You, the disciples, you to whom the mysteries of the kingdom have been revealed. I've been with you the whole time. I've been explaining my parables. I've been teaching you. I've been answering your questions. I'll tell you what, some of those questions have been pretty slow. Oh, yeah, sorry. I've been answering your questions and talking to you. Who do you say I am? And we're not left hanging, are we? Peter, in his role as group spokesperson, and boy, he does take up that role sometimes, he finally gets to express the speculation of the group. You know what? We think you're the Messiah. You're God's appointed saving king. You're the one who's going to usher in God's kingdom, God's rule here on earth. You're the one who is going to defeat our greatest enemies. You have come to restore Israel. You, Jesus, you are the Christ. It's a wonderful moment. It's an exciting moment. Finally, to, to put into words their hopes and their dreams. You're the guy, right? And it's a phrase which hasn't been heard since the very beginning of the gospel. It's been kept quiet, subdued, hidden. Jesus keeps saying, be silent. Shush, don't tell anyone. Ah, uh-uh, go away. Don't. He's been putting blockers on this phrase. He's made sure demons can't proclaim it the whole way through. He... But now finally it's declared. You are the Christ. After all that Jesus has said and done, after all the miracles and debates and teaching, finally at last, the truth about Jesus is recognised and spoken. And even as Peter proclaims Jesus the Christ, what does King Jesus, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, what is he saying? Oh, finally, lads, you got it. All right, now I can get to work. I want you to tell everyone you possibly can, Get the crew in, let's build a massive army, and let's, 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 let's get this project on the road. Is that what he does? I mean, they finally worked it out, haven't they? That's what you should do, get the program going. No. That's, that's, that's not what he does. From that massive climax, we have a huge anti-climax. Verse 30, and I'll read it out. And he strictly charge them to tell no one about them. Him. Yeah, Peter, you're right. You are right. That is who I am. But don't tell anyone. You must not tell anyone. In fact, the language here doesn't come across as strongly as it really is. When he actually strictly charged them, it's the same language he uses when he commands the demons. This is not optional. This is not subtle. This is not polite. This is not nuanced. This is a brutal slap on the back of the head with a sledgehammer. You are not to speak about this to anyone else. Ah, don't. You know, looking over the glasses, smiling. Don't do it. When it's time, it will be Jesus. It will be Jesus who breaks the silence. But in his time. For now, there's a problem. It must remain quiet because there's a huge problem. Remember the blind man who had his sight restored? It was restored slowly. It's going to take the disciples some time. In fact, it's going to take a lot of hard work to see, to understand what it means for Jesus to be the Christ, not what they think it means for Jesus to be the Christ. Because what Peter says, you're the Christ, means is very, very different to what Jesus means when he agrees. Yes, the word is correct, I am the Christ, but what I think the Christ is and what you think the Christ is are two very different things. Not entirely, but foundationally, they are very different things. The crowds, they are not ready for it. What they want, probably what the disciples want, is not what Jesus wants. You know, guys, we may not dwell in ancient pagan culture, a culture that worships Pan or Baal, 
But we do live in a world just as pagan. And that means it's a world which fills itself with the worship of anything but the God who created us. We still take the good that God has given us and the world turns them into objects of worship. Family, sport, vocation, careers, popularity, entertainment, symbols of wealth and success, all these good things that God gives us, we can turn them into idols to replace him. We are in a world that looks to anything else but to Jesus for meaning, for purpose, for hope. The world is looking for a different Christ. But Jesus is asking us, he's asking me, and he's asking you, look at what I've done. Look at who I am and see. Tell me. Who do you say I am? Do we have eyes to see? Do we yet understand? Do we know what it means to say, You are the Christ? Let's pray. Lord, we all know what we want, although sometimes we know that we want, but not what we want. Sometimes the things we want are not good. Or we want the good things the wrong way. Father, we are a deeply confused people without you. Father, give us eyes to see who Jesus is. Give us hearts that are humbled so that as we know him better and better and better for every day of our life, we will grow in our understanding of what it means to declare Jesus is Lord. He is Christ, your saving King. Father, help us to trust him, to follow him, and to put him first in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. If you are joining us on Facebook live stream or recording, thanks for being with us. Uh, I'm going to say the usual things. Click, like, write questions. But I just want to thank you. If you're joining us because you can't make it, it's good. It's good that you're here. But if you can make it in person, that's the best thing. And we'd love to see you in person, get to know you, care for you, and to be cared and known by you as well. Uh, The gathering of God's people is what we're called to. But as a backup, we know that if you can't make it, for whatever reason, it's good that you've joined us today. Next week... We're going to take a break from our series in Mark. This was the this is the kind of the midpoint between Act One and Two in the Gospel of Mark. We've reached the climax where finally the disciples have articulated who Jesus is, and then for the next big section, they now have to learn what it means what they've just declared. And in fact, Jesus' frustration with the disciples only increases and increases and increases, and the hostility to Jesus increases as they make a very long extended journey south to Jerusalem where finally Jesus will meet the absolute rejection of who he is. Um, But we're going to do that a little bit later. We've we've had a fair time in Mark, so we're going to take a bit of a break. Seems like a good spot to do it. So next week uh, we're going to look at a psalm for Advent, a preparation for celebrating the birth of Christ. And so we're going to look at Psalm 72. So if you want to do a little bit of pre-reading, read Psalm 72 over the next week in a bit of preparation, that would be good. But we'll talk more about that then, otherwise you'll get two sermons in one day and you don't want that. Uh, For now we're going to close in prayer, and then we'll close the live stream and the recording. Let's pray. Father, you are good, and your Son is the Christ, the Messiah, your saving King. Father, I pray, we pray, that through your spirit you'd be at work in our hearts that who Jesus is is who we come to know. That we would let go of our ideas, our hopes, our worldly desires and submit to your word, to what you tell us, to who you are and to who your son is. Lord, help us to see truly our king, our saviour, our Lord, our Christ. 
We pray this in Jesus' good name for his glory's sake. For the closer we know him, the more we love him, the greater our witness we will be to him. And so it's for his glory's sake we pray. Amen.